Hey everyone, it's Marvin. Thanks so much for listening to Books and Boba. Uh, I just wanted to take a quick second to remind you that Books and Boba just launched our Patreon uh, to help support our future endeavors. Rira and I have been running Books and Boba for the last six and a half years, and we've always talked about wanting to do more, um, including expanding our content offerings, um, being able to go to book events, and do more coverage. And so um, to help us get closer to those ambitions, um, we started a Patreon to help us grow and to better support books by Asian and Asian American authors. We are offering two tiers for our Patreon. Um, the first is our regular Boba member coming in at $3 a month, which will give you access to our brand new Books and Boba Discord server so you can engage with your fellow Books and Boba Club members and also Rira and myself in real time. Uh, this is where we'll be aiming to move the bulk of our book club discussions. Uh, but rest assured, we'll still have a presence on Goodreads as well. And our premium tier is our Honey Boba member tier coming in at $5 dollars a month where in addition to access to our discord server you'll also get access to our monthly boba chats a bonus podcast where rira and i and some guests will get together each month and have a a more casual discussion on stuff that may or may not be book related as well as answer some listener q a honey boba members will also have access to a poll to help decide an official books and boba book pick uh, once per quarter so if any of that sounds interesting to you, um, support Books and Boba on Patreon by going to patreon.com slash books and boba. As always, we and I really appreciate your support. All right. Thanks for listening. And I'm on with the show. Hey, everyone. It's Marvin. This episode of Books and Boba is sponsored by Mai Theater in New York City and their upcoming production of Once Upon a Korean Time. Founded in 1989, Mai Theater Company is a professional, award winning nonprofit 501c3 organization whose primary mission is to develop and produce new and innovative plays by Asian American writers. They're a great theater company out in New York who has distinguished themselves as one of the country's leading incubators of new works shaping local and national conversations about what it means to be Asian American today. Their latest production, Once Upon a Korean Time, is a generation spanning new journey through the historical and fantastical. Mixing traditional Korean fables with the horrors of the Korean War, Daniel K. Isaac's epic new play is a funny and deeply moving analog for the experiences of the Korean American diaspora. Isaac deftly moves his characters through time, tracing the legacies of trauma that are passed down from one generation to the next, and the various coping mechanisms each one uses to soldier on. The show features sea kings, bubbles, tigers, generational traumas, and of course, barbecue, and is the professional playwriting debut for Daniel K. Isaac, um, who who previously acted on Billions, The Chinese Lady, and of course made an appearance on a previous iterations of Haikus for Hotties. Previews begin August 23rd at La Mama's Ellen Stewart Theater in New York City, and will be there for a limited engagement until September 18th. So if you are in the New York area or plan to make a trip to New York in the coming weeks, um, definitely check it out. Tickets are now available at maitheater.org. Um, there will be a link in the show notes. But if you're curious, the website is ma-yi-theater.org. That's right. It's theater with an R-E. So you know it's fancy. Books and Boba listeners can get a ticket at the discounted price of $30 by entering the coupon code Books and Boba, all caps. And if you do attend the show, please let us know. Rira and I are stuck here on the West Coast, so we won't be able to make it. But we do want to hear your thoughts on the play as well. Once again, you can get discounted tickets for Ma'i Theater's production of Once Upon a Korean Time by entering the promo code Books and Boba, all caps. All right, now on with the show. You're listening to... Whoa! And hey everyone, you're listening to Books and Boba, a book club and podcast featuring books by Asian and Asian American authors. My name is Marvin Yue. And I'm Rira Yue. And today we have another amazing author interview. Um, this time we're chatting with Sangu Mandana, the author of The Very Secret Society of Irregular Witches, which is coming out uh, this week on August 23rd. Um, she's also the author of the Kiki Kalira series of uh, middle grade fantasy novels. So for our listeners out there who have not heard about this book, uh, The Very Secret Society of Irregular Witches obviously has witches. Uh, <laughs> it's about a modern day witch who is 
kind of hired to be a nanny for three young girls who need to be able to control their witch powers. And that is all I'm going to leave it at. There <laughs> might be some like hot librarian in the mix, but um, yeah, it's a very cozy read and I really enjoyed reading it. Yeah, it was so much fun. I, I know this is considered an adult fiction book. Uh, and, and is it adult romance? Is it considered that we are? It's adult con- contemporary yeah. romance. Right. It's a lot of things. <laughs> We read a lot of books in this podcast, but not all of them are books that I sit down and finish in one sitting. And this was definitely one of those books. I had a lot of fun reading it. And it's a very British book, too. It's a very English book. I I mean, it makes sense, Marvin, (laughs) because Sangu is British. But yeah, like, just imagine, like, you know, magical houses in the English countryside. And you'll pretty much get the setting of this book. Um, like we said, it's cozy, it's charming, and um, you know I chuckled quite a bit throughout this book. It's very and funny, the, yeah. The racial diversity in this book, as well as a, the diversity of like sexualities, I was pretty impressed. So yeah, yeah, yeah. We had a great chat with Sangu about her inspirations for the book, her inspirations as an author, and yeah, I hope you enjoy our conversation with Sangu. Hi, I'm Shin Yi Pai, host of the podcast The Blue Suit. In a world full of stuff, what do we choose to hold on to? The Blue Suit is a podcast about commonplace objects and the people who transform them into something remarkable. From an inherited Chinese English dictionary to an old caliphone playing records left behind by Japanese Americans incarcerated during World War II, our podcast showcases modern day artifacts of Asian America and what gets elevated to heirloom status. Find it by searching for The Blue Suit wherever you get your podcasts. And we are here with Sangu Mandana, the author of the Kiki Kalira series, the Celestial series, and several other novels about magic, monsters, and myths. Today, we are here to chat with her about her newest book, The Very Secret Society of Irregular Witches. Uh, welcome, Sangu. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you're calling from overseas. Riru, is this our first? It's not our first overseas guest, is it? It is definitely not, Marvin. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yes, I am. Um, England. Yeah. Eight hour time difference, I think. It works out perfectly because your evening is our morning. So mm, it's not like um, yeah. sometimes when we talk to East Coast people and they want like a morning time slot, we're like, OK, I guess we can wake up at 6 a.m. to talk to you. Oof. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we like to begin our interviews by asking our authors, were you always a writer or is this something that came later in life? Like how how did you come into writing? Uh, yes, always, I would say. Um, certainly, I was always a storyteller. Uh, not necessarily in a good way. Um, I, I spun many a yarn when I was um, a child and told many a lie that got more and more elaborate. And coincidentally, that kind of tailed off when I started actually putting these stories down on on paper. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so I'd say probably always a storyteller. Um, and I think, you know, for as long as I remember, I've wanted to write. Like I was what, like eight or nine when I started writing actual short stories. Um, they weren't good, but <laughs> they were they, they were short stories. And by the time I was 14, I was writing like, you know, like giant epic fantasies. Um, again, not good, but, but they were, they were written. And, you know, I always say that, like, even if a book is terrible, it's practice for the next one. So I think this is absolutely something that I've always been doing and something I've always wanted to do. Um, saying that it took a very long time to start doing it professionally. Um, I was 22 when I signed my first book deal. And started kind of thinking about it seriously when I was 15. So we're talking seven years of trying. 
Uh, I mean, so, 22 yeah. is very young to get <laughs> a book is. deal. <laughs> it is very young. When but you I say think... that it took a long time, I'm like, oh, yeah. no, that's I know. actually it, like, not that long of a time. <laughs> it does sound ridiculous when like you say, oh, I was 22. It took a really long time. But I think like for me, feeling that I'd started seriously at 15, it was a seven year kind of um you know, trying different manuscripts, sending them out, getting rejections, sending more out, getting more rejections. Um, I, b- believe me when I say it felt like a very long time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've noticed like we've interviewed authors who, you know, were still in college when they published their first book. And mm-hmm. um, I think a lot of people in media underestimate them because they're so young and you know, like it turns out that they practice their craft almost just as long as other authors who came out later in life because they started from a very young age. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think regardless of how old you are when you first publish a book, very, very few authors like r- write a book for the very first time and then publish that. Um, like reg- whether you're 40 or 20, you've probably been doing it practicing for a long time um so yeah I I don't really think the age matters that said um I do think (laughs) having an early start helps (laughs) yes it does it absolutely does but I also think that I like for me I can't speak for anybody else but for me I feel like that I understand more about the world I have a broader perspective now than I did when I was 22 yeah So forgive me for this very basic of Asian author (laughs) questions, but how did your parents react when you wanted to be a professional writer? (laughs) (laughs) So, you know, if it had been most other families, I think that that would have been a very um, like a controversial subject. But I actually grew up in a pretty artistic family. Um, my, my mother was a bit more of the, of the sort of, you know, do the sensible, steady thing, get a steady job. She's a teacher now. And so she was very much like a believer of the steady paycheck, which, you know, I can't blame her. Like it, it's not fun to be, <laughs> to sort of wait on a, on an, like an indeterminate amount of time for a paycheck that may or may not come this year. But my dad, um, is an actor. And I grew up kind of backstage with him a lot. So he was very much on the on the creative train. And I remember like very clearly that when I was sort of 17 or 18, he said, you know, you really should kind of keep going at this. So, I mean, I did get quite a lot of encouragement, all things considered. Um, lots of extended family thought I was absolutely insane, of course. <laughs> Um, because, you know, I mean, I think like most Asian families, uh, certainly Indian families, there were lots of doctors and engineers and um, scientists and teachers and just people with sensible jobs <laughs> in, in the family. Lawyers, lots of lawyers. Um, whereas I was the one who just, well, my dad and I, I suppose, were the ones who, who went off the beaten path. <laughs> I think they're all just jealous, to be honest. <laughs> I mean, it's funny you say that your dad um, is an actor because uh, one of your characters in the very secret society of irregular witches is uh, an actor, a very uh, colorful character, shall we say. <laughs> so it like it's sort of coming together where the inspiration for that character. Yeah, uh, I mean, there was from. absolutely something there. Um, I would say that Ian is a lot more. Um, um, dramatic, a lot more um, quirky <laughs> than my dad is. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think that my love of the stage growing up like that and having a father who was a stage actor really did play into that choice. So you are the author of the Kiki Kalira series, which is a middle grade fantasy based Mm. on Indian mythology. You've also written um, like sci-fi books. And I'm just (laughs) really impressed by your range of genres. So what was it like changing gears for uh, your adult romance novel? Weird, but also... I think had I done it at any other time, it might have been a lot harder. But 
it was something I did at a time when it's what I really needed. Um, like when people ask me like when I started writing this or why I started writing it, I always say that we were several months into the pandemic. Um, it was towards the end of 2020, which as we all know, was like the worst year ever. Um, and I wanted to just lose myself in something cozy and romantic and but still fantasy because that is where my heart is uh, a more magical softer warmer story that made me happy um because you know as much as i love my children's books they that they've got monsters they've got battles they have mythology they have a lot of things in them that um was just a bit too too much for me at the time yeah um so i guess we can get into your latest book can you tell us a little bit about your inspirations to writing a book about which is in modern Britain? Uh, so why specific? Um, <laughs> you know, it's one of those things where people ask you why you thought of something and then every thought has gone out of your head. <laughs> um, every, every memory is gone. Um, why? Well, I knew that I wanted the story to be um, a book for adults uh, with a witch who's about my own age. And I wanted it to also be set in Norfolk in England, which is where I live, because I've never done that before. I'd never set a book right here where, I, where I've lived for the last 10 years. And I wanted to really weave in the local countryside, the sea, the sort of like there are lots of references to real places. And it just felt like a really nice way to... I don't know, show off some a place I really love while also telling a magical story. So I think because of that, it was inevitably a modern day story. Plus, I mean, I think I am, um, I don't know if I have, I'm not saying I'd never do it, but I don't know that I'd necessarily have the skill yet to go to like dig into like a historical novel or um and like, you know, like I wanted something that was a bit more grounded in kind of today. And there's an element of social media as well, which sort of made it essential that it be set roundabout now. And yeah, and I think it was just something that felt right. I mean, <laughs> what I really loved about your setting, especially is because, you know, your group, your society, quote unquote, um, mm. of which is we're so multicultural too. And I'm sure that was very, you know, intentional on your part to make yeah. make it that way, right? I mean, it was it was a deliberate choice. I knew from the start that my main character, my witch, was going to be a woman of color. And the sort of character I'd never seen in books growing up. And I knew that I wanted the cast to be quite multicultural. Because, you know, at the end of the day, I think... Even in a majority white country like England, like the US, there are still <laughs> so many communities of color and it is a multicultural world. And I think it's that it's unrealistic to pretend that it's just this all white landscape. Um, and so I wanted that. I wanted to have this diverse, multicultural society um, that in which the multiculturalism is no big deal. It just is, because that's just how people are. And, you know, the, a part of it also comes in to, like, the element of people living on the margins and feeling like they don't quite belong and fit in. And that comes into it as well, because witches are on the margins in this book. And it's not a coincidence that, therefore, a lot of them are women of colour. Yeah, so many intersections in your characters, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was a really, it was intentional, but also enjoyable. Like, I had a lot of fun, and I really enjoyed being able to reflect the world I know in this story, rather than the more expected, kind of um, homogenous, kind <laughs> of like, one-size-fits-all society. I was telling Sangu uh, before we started recording that her book was like a session of therapy for me because it was so <laughs> it was it was like a slow burn slice of life, which is like my favorite genre ever. And then you mm. add in a sprinkle of magic. And I'm like, yes, 
But your book kind of reminded me of a lot of books that I really liked growing up, um, like Noah Streetfield's uh, children's book, The Ballet Shoes. Mm-hmm. There are three adopted sisters in that as well, and uh, their last name is Fossil. So I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> uh, it was like reminded of that and like The Secret Garden, like so many mm-hmm. children's book with, I, I guess, like just that magical English countryside <laughs> lore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I know exactly what you mean, because those are the kinds of books I loved growing up as well. Um, and I mean, I guess, you know, I wouldn't, I, I don't think that at any point I consciously thought of ballet shoes while I was writing this. But the more people mention it, the more I realize, you know what, it was there in the back of my head. It had to have been because I love it. It must have been there. And, you know, the three little girls, adopted girls in this like quirky family in one house. And um, I just loved that. And I think, again, it comes back to the fact that I loved these stories, but we never saw people of color in these stories. And I wanted to, well, write a story that I could see myself in. Yeah, the closest we've gotten were like Studio Ghibli films. And yes. <laughs> those aren't <laughs> real people. <laughs> Many of which are based on books by white people with white characters. Um, yes, I think Kiki's yes. Delivery Service is one of the exceptions because that is actually based on a book by a Japanese author. But yeah, most of them, like Howl's Moving Castle, (laughs) love it. Love the book, love the movie, but, you know, lots of white people. So um, Mika Moon is recruited by the Nowhere household through her witchy social media account. And I thought this was very specific. Um, How familiar are you on that niche part of the internet? (laughs) Um, I don't know about familiar, but I have found my, (laughs) I found myself there, um, quite a lot. I mean, I, um, I don't know whether it's like my ADHD or my OCD or either or, or both, but like, I find myself getting very into things for like, like I will hyper focus. I will become obsessed with something for six months and then I'll move on to something else. And so there there have been times in my life where I've become really um, attached to the idea of, like, what a present-day, modern-day witch might be. Um, gardening, plants, tea, all these things, and all of them come back, come into play in this book because they're all kind of like that connection to the earth and to nature. And I think that's where I often find myself, in that niche of, like... Um, like witch talk or witchstagram, <laughs> I'm not sure. Like, well, um, but that's where I usually find myself with like the plant witches and the tea witches. And uh, so, I mean, I wouldn't say I'm familiar, and I wouldn't say that I like practice or anything like that. But I, um, I have been in that part of the internet, and I do typically find it to be a really like soothing, comforting place to be. I feel like it's the intersection between uh, dark academia and then cottagecore. It's just like yes. right in the middle. And that's why I love it, I think. It's kind of like, it sort of skews more towards like light academia and cottagecore. And then obviously you'll also have like the dark academia elements. And I think that's why I love it because I love those things. <laughs> And it kind of combines them. Yeah, I love all of the modern magic and the rules of magic. And there's also the capital rules of the society. (laughs) So uh, just like, can you fill us in on how you came about developing those rules? Uh, Well, I knew from the, or at least from quite early on, that I wanted the magic in this world to feel like a living thing that it to be, um, so I think Mika reflects a few times in the book that for a very long time, the only constant thing in her life has been magic and that all they've had is each other, she and magic. And I really loved that idea of it being like a comforting present companion or friend. And also in the same vein, something that has a mind of its own and can be mischievous and can be um, willful, (laughs) I think. Um, So, I mean, I think all the rules that I came up with, not the capital rules that Primrose comes up with for the society, but like the magical rules, all those sort of like were a natural progression of the idea that magic was this um, almost living sentient entity. 
And so it was things like, you know, you've got to be clear or it won't understand you. You've got to, like, be willful, have a stronger will than the magic or, you know, it'll do what it wants. And it wants to be, you know, used by a witch. It's attracted to witches because it, it, they're the only people who can use it and, you know, do fun stuff with it. But you do have to be careful. And I think it was all quite um, kind of like the natural consequences of what it might be like if something like this really existed. And, yeah, I think that's really how the rules formed and shaped themselves. I want to talk about how the narrator in your book is also its own character. And maybe it's because I've been watching a lot more, like, Regency-era stuff because of Netflix (laughs) and, you know, the recent, you know, craze here in the States about that era. But I couldn't help but read your book in the voice of, like, one of those... (laughs) British leads, Emma Thompson or Julie yeah. Andrews, because the the narrator itself is such a character and it's very sassy. And, you know, it's constantly just giving your characters a ton of just crap, right? Yeah. Just making fun of them in the prose. And I guess talk to us about writing in that way. Like what inspired you to just make your narrator so, um, so funny? <laughs> um, well, thank you for saying that. Um, you always hope things will come across as funny, but things that the author finds funny aren't necessarily things the reader finds funny um but no i think like you i love the the sort of the wry um tongue-in-cheek old english lady sort of narration (laughs) and um it was really exciting for me to actually use that here because not only did it feel like the natural voice for the story but it's something that i've never really been able to do in children's fiction um that kind of wry um, overly elaborate way of speaking, tongue-in-cheek kind of humor doesn't, it doesn't necessarily work in an action-packed children's book, but it worked in this story and I just, I had so much fun with it. It is, it does feel like a character on its own. I mean, you often get the fact that we are in other characters' heads, but sometimes you sort of step back and there are observations about people and I enjoyed that. I really did. And I'm really glad that you found it funny. That's, that's a relief. <laughs> Yeah, I was uh, I was surprised too because a lot of uh, romance novels they're written in first person or they uh, go back and forth between uh, the POVs of the heroine or and the love interest. So I was like, oh, this is a third person narrator. Like they have the same type of humor as me. So I really <laughs> enjoy. It. I really enjoyed it. Um, but Jamie and Mika's slow burn romance, like Marvin probably knows this already, but uh, the grump and the sunshine pairing in romances are like probably my favorite. They're like my cup of tea. Um, but I think so many slow burn romances get the pacing and the pining wrong. And it's such a delicate uh balance balancing act you have to do so did you struggle with it while you were writing um and developing the romance I think so yeah um it's (laughs) it mm, it's hard to say how much I struggled at the time because you know when you like it's been about a year since I actually wrote the book and when you spend that long working on something you forget which part of it Um, like where in the timeline you struggled. But I do remember that quite clearly that there was, um, there was an element of when, like when should things really heat up? When should things have a turning point? And, you know, I think that because I had worked on so many children's books where like plot points and turning points are important, I almost use the same mechanics with when a romance turns as well um but only in a only to an extent I would say that it's mostly character driven and there was a lot of I'm impatient even when I read (laughs) yeah I mean like even when I'm reading a slow burn and I love them like I know that when I write them I, I want to like get to the the good stuff um faster so I think that for me it was less about accidentally dragging it on too long and more about making it happen too quickly and so there was a lot of back and forth in like the middle section of the book where I was like maybe I should move this scene a bit earlier maybe I should move this bit a bit later just so that it feels more um more in tune with the character's actual journeys 
And I mean, I think in the end, the bit that the, what made it kind of work for me was the fact that there are specific triggers that happen that change the way the characters feel about each other. And that helps. <laughs> Yeah, I was about to say having a plot helps. <laughs> Not to say that I don't like books that are just all vibes. I mean, I'm all for it, but it really does help push the momentum of the story when you have yes. other things happening besides the romance. And I would really I would actually be hesitant to categorize this as like a rom- romance novel cuz it is very much like a family novel. Mm-hmm. It's about found family and finding a place to belong. Um, everyone in the nowhere household, they come in fractured one way or the other and mm-hmm. uh, somehow they fit together um, in like a puzzle. Uh, so can you tell us more about how you developed the characters, the household of the nowhere family? <sighs> yeah, I mean, I love them. I like... I always say that it is family first and then romance after that. Um, Well, (laughs) Ian and Ken came to me quite easily because they were so vivid. I just knew um, that they were so clear to me. I knew exactly who they were and I knew that they were going to be, you know, two of the guardians to these three little girls. Um, I wouldn't say that they are based on anybody I know, but they, there are resemblances. Um, to an an older couple um, I knew growing up. Uh, So there is a little bit of that. But they are very much themselves. And they were so, I don't know, I just loved the idea of this like elderly, queer, interracial couple falling in love with these three young children and like going to bat for them at every turn. And then, of course, to also have like Jamie as part in part, part of the mix and and I knew from the start that Jamie being the grumpy is would butt heads with Ian but they would also adore each other and that Lucy and Ken would be the ones with some common sense in fact you I need think, a couple of those characters <laughs> exactly <laughs> like I think even my publisher like I think the description of the book says two long-suffering caretakers and that is very much <laughs> what they are Um, and I think in my proposal for the book when my agent and I sent it out I there's a there was a line when I was like describing the synopsis that was something like as the two sanest members of the family (laughs) Lucy and Ken because you know I mean at the end of the day everybody else is a little bit insane um Ian is, Jamie is, Mika absolutely is the three children I mean (laughs) they're all a little bit Um, And Ken and Lucy are very much the kind of the stable ones. So, I mean, I think in the end, it was a very natural dynamic, that kind of finding different pieces that fit together. And their backstory has also evolved quite organically. Uh, Because again, I mean, you know, like you said, they are all fractured in some way and yet somehow find themselves made whole by being part of this family and I think that just, you know, their marginalizations play into it, their histories play into it, their, the trauma they carry. And all of that, I think, kind of, if you spend enough time like living in your character's heads, they kind of unfold. <laughs> well, let's talk about the, the three girls, Rosetta, Terracotta yeah. and Altamira. <laughs> Wonderful names, by the way. <laughs> Um, but yeah, like they are all racially diverse. Uh, mm-hmm. Terracotta is uh, from Vietnam and Altamira is from Palestine uh, and Rosetta is black. And I thought it was really, I mean, I kind of chuckled, but it was also like sad when I read it. But um, was it Ian or Ken? They asked Mika, oh, can you like teach them to come to like come to grabs with their identity as a woman of color like how do you navigate as a witch of color and she's like that's not a subject that we're even going to go into <laughs> yeah and i mean i think their like their need for mika comes from both the fact that she is a witch and the only person who can teach them um the magic control over their magic and also the fact that she is a woman of color and you know while i deliberately made that choice for them to recognize that they as four not um 
but for not women of color would wouldn't have the perspective Mika would have. I also made the choice to like have a couple of them take it just a step too far and expect her to be able to like somehow explain to these three diverse identities, none of which she shares with them, that <laughs> how to kind of navigate their own identities. And you know, it is it is a thing, isn't it, that you assume that one person can somehow speak for everybody. And she's just like, yeah, no, that's that's not how this works. <laughs> I can help, but I cannot like be everything to everyone. Um, but yeah, it was, again, a very conscious decision to have three diverse children. And it was a conscious decision to kind of play into that problematic trope of like the wealthy white lady who adopts um, children from like poorer less developed countries, typically, um, often war-torn, as in the case of Palestine. And, you know, and I wanted to go into that, into the fact that neither Lillian nor Primrose really understand what they're doing when they take in. They have good intentions, as people often do, but they don't really understand what they're doing when they pluck these children out of their native countries. And it is, and it's the others Ian and Ken and Lucy and Jamie, who have the compassion to recognize that maybe something might be missing in their lives and to work on that. And yeah, like that was something that I, that was important to me to sort of explore that. Yeah, I mean, Mika is from um, South India and she was mm-hmm. adopted by Primrose, like you mentioned. And um, I'm sure like readers of the um, Kiki Kalira series you know, they're used to seeing all this, like, Indian mythology and, yeah. uh, you know, like, so many, like, cultural influences. But Mika literally does not have that like, because she was displaced. And I thought that was a really um, interesting touch uh, to your story. And I guess, like, a good break for you as well. <laughs> from, yeah, like, the research. I mean, I think... <laughs> yeah. I think it is important to show that people of color exist who have no connection to their country of origin. Um, And also to show that that can both be a good thing, that, you know, they are American or they are British, they're not something else. But also to show that maybe in some ways they've been cut off from something that is an essential part of them. I mean, like, I know that I... For example, like I grew up in India. I'm now British. My husband is white British. My children are multiracial. And I know that it's important for me to continue to show them aspects of Indian culture and, our, and their heritage because that's that's what I know and that's what I want them to know. But I don't necessarily think that people should be forced into a box and that Like in Mika's case, she's not Indian. She is of Indian origin. She has brown skin. She is a woman of color and she deals with the world the way a woman of color would. But she is a British woman who has never known any other life. Yeah, it's definitely an identity that people in real life have. Um, So there's a quote in the book that I thought was, this is where I was like, this is therapy. Um, (laughs) There's a quote that says, uh, some kinds of trauma can't be revisited and some needs to be. And we see multiple characters in your book who are kind of uh, grappling with the consequences of uh, their guardian's actions and the impact of childhood trauma. Uh, Why was it important for you to have that as a recurring theme? You know, I think that... (sighs) I think it's because trauma is such a complicated and vast thing. Um, I mean, for a really long time, people thought that PTSD could only happen to certain kinds of people. But, you know, trauma can happen to anybody. It can take any shape. And I think even, um, like in Mika's case, she has all the essentials you think somebody needs to live. Food, shelter, um, books to read (laughs) but she does not have love or trust like she cannot form that connection with anybody she grows up with and in Jamie's case he has those connections and then is betrayed by them and 
I just wanted to show, because it's important to me as well, with like coming from a background where I had everything I needed to kind of survive. I had, and I had love. I was loved by my family, but that's not to say that there weren't experiences in my life that were traumatic in different ways. And I wanted to show that there are different ways that trauma can manifest and that they can, it can continue to kind of affect you long after you think the thing is over. And yeah, and I mean, it's like, you know, Jamie says, sometimes you need to kind of revisit it. And sometimes it's better to just keep moving forward. Yeah. I mean, generational trauma is a theme that we encounter a lot on this book club because it's a topic that I think a lot of, especially Asian authors, like to explore because most of us come from families who a generation or two ago were constantly surrounded by war Mm -hmm. and that kind of, that stuff gets passed down. And there's so many just allegories that I saw from your book, you know, the fact that Primrose as the elder has different values from from Mika and there, there's a clash in that. Like how, do, how do we raise the next generation? Uh, how do I give them something that I didn't have? But at the same time, in her mind, she was giving love in her own way yeah. by providing these basic essentials, which is what a lot of us experience from you know, our parents and grandparents. Um, and you know, <laughs> I don't know if I'm reading too much into this, but the fact that part of the way Primrose protects her, her society is to keep them isolated from each other because when witches gather, you know, in your world, the magic gathers around them and that kind of starts making them suspicious. It makes me think about how like racial enclaves are always viewed with suspicion Mm -hmm. because, oh, these people are gathering together. They're suspicious, right? And there's that constant just fear of we can't be in community because then people will start suspecting us. Yes. I mean, you know, that was, um, I don't think you're reading too much into that. Um, (laughs) It was, it is, it is a thing, isn't it? It's um, like, I mean, I'm an immigrant and I know that, like there are communities of like South Asian people here in the UK, communities of East Asian people, like clusters. And I understand why people do that because you seek out people who will understand you, sometimes in language, sometimes in customs. Um, but at the end of the day, you are also viewed as other when that happens. And yes, a lot of like, and I think Primrose is, like you said, um, complicated in that way because she is so antagonistic in so many ways, yet it comes from a place of fear and love and wanting to protect by controlling. And it's not necessarily a good thing, but there are, there is, like, there is a reason there. She's struggling with her own kind of trauma, her own fear of what happens when you're othered, when you are viewed as wrong or suspicious. And she knows, she has first-hand experience of what that's like. And she's determined to make sure no one else has to experience that, even if that means that witches have to lead lonely lives. And it's that clash between the modern day, the, like the younger, um, more hopeful Mika wanting more, and the older, more set in her ways, Primrose, like still reacting out of fear. Which I think, yes, again, is ties in very is familiar to so many of us who have experienced that kind of clash of generations and the generational trauma. Yeah. Um, so I have one very important question. Uh, <laughs> if you could have only one practical magic spell, what would it be? Because there were a lot of practical magic Oof. like sneaked here and there in the book. Oh, oh. Um, I thought the bug one was pretty good. So uh, for, good, for, right? <laughs> for our listeners out there, uh, Mika has like this, I guess, like potion that's kind of like an essence uh, that she drops onto the floor and it scares away all of the bugs. So no bugs will ever come into her house. And that sounds super useful for California. because <laughs> Oh, man, it's been so muggy here. And every time season. I go take a shower, there's some friends in my bathtub that have to wash down the drain. Yeah, I mean, it's been so hot here in England this summer that it's like spiders everywhere. And look, I know that like Australians laugh at us because they have spiders that are like that big and we have spiders that are like that big, but I hate them all. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, I mean I'm mean, i not going to lie, Mika's like insect repellent spell absolutely came from my own like wish to have something like that. Um <laughs> 
So, I mean, maybe that one, but like, I mean, I suppose on a more kind of, on a deeper, more emotional, um, less petty level, <laughs> um, I probably like um, like a tea, one of the teas she brews to like make you feel better. Um, like, you know, like effectively like an antidepressant in a tea. That would be nice. <laughs> I'm partial to the speed spell, the one that lets oh, her travel yes. great distances. That's, I mean, 100%. Yeah. I mean, here in LA, the traffic <laughs> is so terrible. So the idea that you could just shorten your drive <laughs> by using the, <laughs> the speed spell. Yeah, definitely. You no, know, that is that that is very true. I mean, like if it could work on planes and I had to go visit my family in India and it's like a 10 hour flight, I'd be like, nope. <laughs> making it an hour <laughs> i would probably um i think there should be like a t for like avoiding bad topics in conversations <laughs> with, <laughs> which changes. yeah it's like yeah like it's like i know like when you have tea it's like you have to do small talk and it's like what if you just mm. skipped all of that yes all the awkward this is stuff me as an introvert just uh just <laughs> well, like ideas. you know like Oh, like when you're sitting down with like, you know, all the grandmas and the elderly relatives and they're asking you about like your life in that judgy yeah, your way. Love life. It could and be like, 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 <laughs> like, are you married yet? Why don't you have children? Like, you know, why is your skin so crap? It's like, oh, for God's sake. <laughs> can we please avoid all of this? Yeah, no, that would be a very good tea. So I, I'm just curious, are you planning on writing a sequel to this book or is it a standalone? It is a standalone for now, but I would absolutely love to revisit the world. Like, I love these characters. I just think I need to wait for the right story. Um, but my book next year, um, the one I'm writing right now, which will be out around this time next year, is similar. Not the same, not the same characters, not the same setting, um, but similar. Still the same vibes. So, <laughs> Yeah, I would love to read a sequel that kind of uh, goes into the curse behind mm. the witch's uh let's say predicament yes <laughs> yeah <laughs> again this was such such a fun read and so much character and yeah thank you for writing such a fun and cozy book it, it was just such a like i sat down and then four hours later i finished it and Aww. it's just one of those reads for me oh well, thank yeah. you so much for saying that that's <laughs> really nice <laughs> I, the the new york times uh their review of your book was headlined as like a pile of golden retriever puppies <laughs> drenched in glitter and i was like wow what a headline um, i know but i'm also like very inclined to agree it is a it is a it, it, I mean, book i can't disagree i can't it is very much like that um yeah we all like my whole publishing team we all just laughed so hard when we saw that because it was like that's just like the perfect like tagline that's just going to be in my bio forever that i'm just that i write books like a pile of golden retriever puppies drenched in <laughs> glitter <laughs> Well, saying thank you so much for joining us on Books and Blah Blah. It was such a pleasure to talk to you. And yeah, good luck on you know your next book. Um, we're looking forward to it as well. And yeah, have a have a cool summer. I know it's hot over there as well. <laughs> I hope. Um, but yeah, thanks so much for having me, and it's been so much fun. Uh, yeah, and I very much hope for a for a cool. I'm I'm just ready for autumn now. <laughs> like I'm done. <laughs> And that was Sangu Mandana, the author of The Very Secret Society of Irregular Witches, um, available, available at booksellers everywhere, including our Books and Boba online bookshop as well. So um, if you're interested in this pile of golden retriever puppies drenched in glitter, I think that was the, the tagline, um, check it out. Um, and also, shameless plug, if you do purchase the book off of our bookshop, it does support our podcast as well as your local bookstore. So that's cool, too. Um yeah this is definitely a book that i'm gonna recommend to my friends who just are looking for something fun to read for sure yeah yeah for sure um before we go uh mira can you remind us of what we're reading for the month of august so we are reading honey and issues guide to fake dating by adiba jagradar um so it is about a bisexual teenager who comes out to her friends as bi and her friends who are terrible tell her that you can't be bisexual because you've only had crushes on guys and she's like well i kind of have a girlfriend or i am in a relationship with um like with this other girl in school and they start a fake dating relationship so 
Yeah. I already love the premise. I'm pretty excited to read this book. I know a lot of our uh, listeners are also excited because it was, you know, it was retweeted a lot on our social media account. So really looking forward to hearing all of your thoughts. Yeah, we'll be discussing that book at the end of the month, as always. So if you have finished the book and have your own feedback to give, um, please let us know on our Goodreads forums. Um, we do love to include the comments of our listeners in our discussions as well. Uh, but on that note, that'll do it for this episode of Books and Boba. Uh, thank you all so much for listening, and we'll see you all next time. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks for listening to Books and Boba. This podcast was hosted by Marvin Yue and Ri Ryu and edited and produced by Marvin Yue. Follow the book club on Twitter and Instagram by going to at Books and Boba and engage with us on Goodreads on our Goodreads group. You can also check out past episodes of the podcast by going to booksandboba.com and by subscribing to us on your favorite podcast app. Don't forget, you can support Books and Boba and Asian American authors by purchasing books at our bookshop.org account. Check out the link in our show notes and also at booksandboba.com. Books and Boba is a proud member of the Potluck Podcast Collective, a collective of Asian American hosted podcasts featuring unique voices and stories from the Asian diaspora. Learn more about the collective and check out our fellow Potluck shows by visiting the website podcastpotluck.com. Thanks for listening. Hey, I'm Bill Yu, and you may know me from a blog called Angry Asian Man. And I'm Jeff Yang, author, journalist, and celebrity dad. We host a podcast called They Call Us Bruce, an unfiltered conversation about what's happening in Asian America. Each week or so, we host a discussion about some of the most vital and interesting topics in our pop culture and our community, bringing in guests who are shaping and informing this thing called Asian America from Hollywood to D.C. and beyond. Uh, we've got media, entertainment, food, family, politics, representation, the good, the bad, the WTF of it all. So check us out wherever you get your podcasts or at theycallsbruce.com. Peace. Peace. Peace.